Heavenly Father, thank you for today. We thank you for the Lord's house and Father that you're ministering to people in this building all week long. So we lift up the other two churches in the building. We lift up the children's hours. We pray that the Spirit of God moves. So we're coming into this building. They recognize Jesus Christ. And we thank you for it in your holy name. Amen. Now today is going to be a Sunday school, a teaching. It's not going to be a preaching. It's not going to be a sermon. It's going to be uh, something to make you think, okay? In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, they beheld he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, what I'm going to do today is make you think. We know Scripture so well that when we hear the Scripture, we go, and make the application like we've always made the application. And it can be good, sound application. But often we don't think about what's being said because we know it and we can memorize it and, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me. And what's it done? Nothing. That's why when I realized that way back when, I stopped marking my Bibles because I, whatever I mark, I go right to that and I automatically think, you know. And so what I did, I carved out a place for every scripture in my mind in application. And I was missing all the other application that could be seen there. So today I'm going to give you a, an example of how when I read books, I don't care what they are or who they're by, I see spiritual truths that are said different ways. Now we're talking about total heathens, okay? We're talking about religious, you know, uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about indigenous people in northern uh, Siberia, uneducated, un no religion, no, you know, uh, okay, I'm going to, but when I read the book about these people, every, these are psychological truths I'm going to talk about, and relationship truths, but mostly internal psychology is scriptural, okay? I'm going to talk about Jesus and the bear today. I just made that up so you'd remember it. So, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's going on, and you shall be when it's you know, no, back up. Really? You receive power in you, your life changes. So I want to I'm gonna go through this book, and I don't encourage you to buy the book, by the way. It's it's uh, uh, by a, a anthropologist who uh, had this experience and she's explaining her experience and, and it's just uh, uh, don't buy the book, okay? Uh, but it is in the eye of the wild is what it's called. Now, what happened here, I'm continuing from wounds, wisdom, and blessings from last Sunday. Wounds that you have become wounds. You, you get wisdom from those wounds in order to turn them into blessings. So every trial in our life, if we use it properly, we will learn from it, realize where God is, realize where the scriptures are, and it will become a blessing. And then wisdom from learning through trials, experiences, now listen, and transformation. I'm going to talk about her psychological transformation. We're to have psychological transformation, but because of Jesus Christ. She's coming from a horrific situation, bad, evil, death, okay? That's nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Jesus Christ, nothing to do with the Scripture, but she follows scriptural truths without her even knowing it. So the book is about, uh, she's a French anthropologist, and she's in uh, northern Siberia studying bears in the wild, okay? And... Uh, people end up calling her a medka. It's a person who's half human and half bear. Okay? Medka. All right? Why? She has received something. Okay? Now you got to remember that. All right? Now, uh, it's about mind altering book about terror, pain, and endurance and self transformation. So instead of ugly transformation, we have the best transformation there is, Jesus Christ. But experiencing the bear changed her life. Experiencing Christ changes 
our life. And so it goes on to say, it takes us to the farthest limits of human being and, and, and for her to still be alive, okay? Now, so if you follow that. Okay, <clears throat> last Sunday I talked about people's wounds. Uh, for example, uh, David's wound, and we can look at his past, the wound, or we can look at the transformation. Wounds, wisdom, transformation. Got that? So he said, if you have a David wound, here's this lust, and on and on. However, the wisdom is to transform you to say, that doesn't work, but God does work. Or we had Peter's wound. He denied Christ when, it was, when, he, when he was embarrassed, when he was afraid. But what happens? The, that gave him a wound. He was ashamed of that. He had the wisdom to transform and become known as the rock of Christianity. All right? How about self wound that we talked about so we have an issue we were wounded you know un, none of not our problem we didn't cause somebody else caused it or maybe we do cause it but then we learn from the wisdom and we're transformed by that experience okay now catch that we are transformed by the wisdom of having that experience and what we've learned and we're hence transformed we're stronger and we know how to work that and help other people with it. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be a death, it can be a divorce, it can be incarceration, amputation, you name it. The wound, the wisdom of it, the transformation. And then, of course, there's Jesus on the cross. His wound was taking all of our sin. And the wisdom was His resurrection gives us new life. Now, looking at trials... Tribulation, experiences, transform. Now, this woman, what ha she does, uh, she goes up into Siberia. By the way, she's in a no-fly zone. It's supposed to be secret uh, Russian uh, camp up there, military camp, and nobody's allowed there. The indigenous people are totally ignorant of uh, uh, up to, you know, 20th century, 21st century. I mean, they're still living in the 18th century. And, but they're used as, as uh, you know, uh, virtual slaves, okay, totally ignorant people. So she's studying them and their opinion about bears and this, uh, she talks about uh, hibernation, uh, hybr hybridization. It's the process of an animal or plant breeding with an individual of another species. Hence, and, and we have it today, uh, the liger. It's a hybrid between a male lion and a female lion. Look it up, liger. It's the biggest lion known to mankind right now because they, they, you know, they interbred and then here they became this new thing. Well, her idea is following the indigenous people that if a bear attacks you, which they, a bear did attack her, uh, it pulled her scalp off, uh, it, it crushed her skull, it took a bit out a whole chunk of her jaw, blind in one eye, uh, and scars all over, broke her uh, shoulders. Uh, and so anyway, but she lives through it. Well, she explains when this bear was on her that there is no other at that moment. There's no past, there's no future, only right now. She could feel the breath on him as, she, as he, as he <clears throat> clamped down and bit her jaw out, took it away, ate it, okay, uh, to say other things. And then she'd come to and, and while this bear's maw, mawing on her. But she makes it, she, she lives, and now as she re-experiences this, she realizes she's lived through a death experience, and the people call her, uh, call her uh, Medka, people who are marked by the bear. And others are afraid of Medkas, because you live through that, you're the supernatural, you're other, okay? Now, you start following biblical truths here. You receive Christ. Others are intimidated, supposedly, because you have been empowered, and now you're from the other. You, you, you see, it's all biblical truth, okay? Now, what's interesting is when people see her, uh, and they call her the bear woman, 
Now, the people in the hospital in Russia, then they fly her to England, and, and, and she's known as the bear woman because, look at her, I mean, she'll never be, quote, normal again. But the indigenous people think that she's now supernatural, and they're afraid of her. They won't touch any of her garments. They won't pick up anything, her pack or anything, because they're, they're superstitious. Why? She's been empowered, they believe. Isn't that an example of Christians being empowered? What does the scripture say? But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now see, we read that verse and we're so used to it. We, we know. Do we? You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be transformed with the other. See, this was psychological transformation. Our mind, our, our spirit with Jesus Christ is to be a spiritual transformation, but every bit is transformed. Her life now lived with the bear. Our life now lives with Christ. So she walks through all that. Now I just want to, now I want to I use some of her quotes, but all of these are biblical. I can give you a scripture for every one, so... So play along with me and think, oh, I know that scripture. Oh, I know what scripture will fit there. People, every psychological truth comes from a biblical truth. God made us. God made your mind and how it works. Whether believers discover it or unbelievers discover the process, it's a God thing. So you can quote scripture with this, okay? So the word medka indicate people indicates people marked by the bear. People consider them other than just human. So when we're marked by Christ, we're other than human, right? We have the Spirit of God that gives us power. So don't, you know, so I'm taking it out of religiosity is what I'm doing. Okay. <clears throat> this event at last revealed her own soul to her. Isn't that Christ? All of a sudden, the revelation of Jesus Christ, we realize who we are and who we're not, and who we're not. I was talking to a woman this morning, and uh, is an incident over a dog in our circle, uh, and she said, you know, I'm not going into the whole thing. Uh, she said, well, I see you at Tim Horton's, and, and she thought that I knew who she was. I had no idea. I stopped to talk to her this morning while she was walking her dog. And uh, she said, well, we're at Tim Hortons and, and you don't say anything. And it's like, I don't know who you are. I just now stopped to introduce myself. Well, she thought, well, all this time that she, I see her, them, and I'm not saying hi to her. I don't know who she is. I just stopped and met her. And then she realized, oh, I didn't talk to you because I don't like you. It's, I didn't talk to you because you're not that important to me. I don't know you. And, and she didn't know what to do with that. Okay, so what I was thinking about that, people, none of us are as important as we think we are. And if you're on the deathbed, you realize it's all over. Okay, she thought she was dead. And what happened? Her soul was revealed to her. And how much more when Christ comes into our life and our soul is released, uh, or revealed. Uh, okay, all right. Skip some of this. Um, okay, because you know, in the face of uh, it's the face, uh, it, we face our identity, who we really are. And then here she is. She, now she's recovering. It takes months for her to recover. And she said, "I remember. I replay the scene every evening before going to sleep. The weeks and the hours that led up to the crisis in my life. The weeks and the hours after the crisis in my life." Well, how about the experience of Jesus in your life or the experience of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life? Uh, one author said years ago, back in the 70s, uh, when you receive Jesus and then you receive the Holy Spirit, you probably should be locked up uh, for a month so you calm down and other people can handle you. You know, Remember how great and how good it was to know Jesus? Okay. Uh, Matter of fact, C.S. Lewis lost his wife 
uh, you know, and he's popular and everybody wants to be around him. I got one of his pictures uh, and he's standing there with a coffee cup and a cigarette and he's looking around and here's all these ministers around and they're not talking to him. You know why? Because he just lost his wife and he's in grief and he wants to talk about the grief he's in and nobody wants to hear about the grief. They want to hear wisdom and the success and victory. And he said, I didn't feel like it. He said, I should have been locked up for a couple months while I worked through the grief. I didn't, he didn't want any pat answers, okay? So it was an understanding of what you experienced. He, she starts having night visions with Christ. Shouldn't we have night visions, day visions? I, I want to get back to some of the good stuff, okay? You, you really have to wade through. All, don't, don't buy the book, okay? It, it's, uh, now here's, here's what really spoke to me. Uh, the figure of the bear, okay, the symbolism of the bear. Think about, and, and it goes into what it, what it means to her, strength, courage, uh, the wild, uh, flexibility, refuge, love. Otherwise, she knows this bear has it all, and, and if this bear eats her up, uh, it's all gone. Uh, and well, the symbolism of Christ in our life, remember I keep talking about the two crosses, you know, Protestants don't want the Christ on the cross, and, and Catholics don't want Christ off the cross, you know, uh, that the split in Christianity. We need to understand both. Watch your symbolism of Jesus Christ. Is he long-haired, holding a little sheep, you know? Or is he, uh, are we coming back on the clouds, you know, with a shout of, or, voice of the archangel, a shout of God? You know, watch your symbol, uh, symbolism of Christ and your reflection in that symbolism. How real and how powerful is Jesus Christ in your life? Now, now, now catch this. This, this, is, this is good. But our bodies, now she's being eaten by the bear, and she's reflecting this. Our bodies were commingled. There was that incomprehensible us from then on. She could never get rid of that bear eating her, biting her jaw. You know. she, she says, we were cold mingled. She was fighting the bear. By the way, she had a little hatchet uh, also. But, you know. but what happened? The incomprehensible us. When Jesus, when we are commingled with Jesus Christ, there is nothing else. And then we become co-mingled. When we are co-mingled with Christ, there's the incomprehensible us. Okay? Nobody can understand, but us. You and Christ are now what it's all about. Isn't that right? You and Christ, that's life. Nobody else understands that. And others, like the indigenous people, stand back and go, Woo, you counted the bear. You're different. People, that should be the power of Christ in our life. That people look and say, Whoa, I know where you're coming from. No matter what topic, hot topic it is today, I know where you're coming from. Why? Because the Bi you're going to stand on the Bible, right? Absolutely stand on the Bible. Why? Because the incomprehensible Jesus and me, that's my answer every time. I'll be nice about what you believe, and I'll be nice about your sin. I'll be nice about all this other. But the incomprehensible Christ, what does Jesus Christ say? And that's how we live our life. And so there's no longer a me, you get that, each of you, no longer a me, but a us. You and Jesus. You know, I've been talking about, and I've got a message, I keep putting it off and putting it off. The uh, uh, who is your we, I keep referring to that. I've got a great message if I can ever get to it. Well, your we is you and Jesus. Now, your we should also be you and your spouse, yes. Your we should also be somebody that seeks God with you, yes. Your we should be somebody you pray with, yeah, and on and on and on. That's all my message if I ever get to it. But the real we for each one of us is you and Jesus. It's incomprehensible. You can't get, you can't get around it. That's who you are when you're born again. Okay, so I, I love that. Our bodies were co-mingled. Well, how about our spirits commingled with Jesus Christ and we become the incomprehensible us? Uh, that's my best quote, okay? All right, from her. 
Uh, but let me get back to how she starts understanding after she's healing. <clears throat> okay. The event has to the event you're incomprehensible with Christ has to be transformed so it can be accepted. See, she's living and reliving this bare experience. And, and, and so wild and so unbelievable that she what it transforms her and for her to start accepting that the bear attacked her, the bear wanted to eat her, she was going to die, but she lived. And, and as she thought that through, then she could accept it. And that's the same thing with the born-again experience with Christ. And it must be turned to be consumed and digested. Turned to be consumed and digested. How many times do you think about Christ and what He's done for you? And you're consuming, really? All of that? The pro, you know, what, what 6,000 promises in the Bible? And, and how many do we, we... We can't even consume that, okay? But we take bite after bite. That's why we come to church. Line upon lines, precept upon precept. And so we start consuming this and believing it and obeying it, and it works in our life. It, it is too terrible to imagine it does not fit into her framework. Well, how about it is too fantastic to imagine Christ, God, in you. It doesn't fit in the normal framework. See, we try to fit Christ, we, and we all do this. We, 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 all, we are all religious. Beyond our religiosity, Christ is not limited to what we believe. All the good stuff I'm talking about, Bible stuff. Truth, Christ is still beyond that. And for, it doesn't fit into our framework, okay? When my family used to live up on Oak Street, and I'd walk my daughters down to the school downtown, we'd walk right by this, you know, we came down Oak Street, came straight across uh, Lewis Street, and uh, it, we walked, I never even saw the building. I knew it was there, but that was beyond my framework that God would give us this, because North Pres was here. Beyond my framework. Did that make God any less God? No, no, God's all around us. Beyond, it's beyond what we can think. It's beyond our framework that God Almighty lives in every Christian. That's beyond our framework. <clears throat> I love one of your old quotes. <clears throat> I just wanted him saved to go to heaven. <laughs> and he goes to the mission field. We, I'll never forget that. Julie just wanted you know, her family saved and go to heaven. And they go to the mission field. That was beyond her framework. But it wasn't beyond Christ's framework. What is beyond our framework that Christ wants to live and develop in your life? How about when you're almost 100 years old and you start building houses in Honduras? Well, okay. okay. By the way, met a good friend of yours. She moved into our circle. We'll tell you about it afterwards. And she was shocked that you're 80 some years old. She said, you know, she's got to be younger than me. And said, no, 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 no. And, and so we were talking about it. Kathy will tell you later. Well, you mean at 80 something years? Beyond I, I, Honduras? What, have 14 houses now or whatever it is? It's like, yeah, yeah. God is not limited to our framework. Okay? So it's too, you can't imagine it because he's beyond our framework. And so. Uh, let's see. Let, I like some of her other quotes here. Okay. Uh, you have to be moved to somewhere new in your thought life. And it generally propelled me beyond myself. Isn't that the Holy Spirit? You see these psychological, she's developing this understanding. It's psychological steps because it's spiritual steps of what Christ does for the Christian or does for the world if they will allow it. And so she's realizing these biblical truths, but she doesn't know they're biblical. Now, now, now here, here's the good one, okay? It's an alteration of the relationship to the world. Is that scriptural or what? An alteration of the relationship to the world. You no longer are the old you, 
You now are a new you in Christ, and it alters your relationship. See, why is it that we stop, we, we switch, generally switch friendships? We generally switch circles. We generally, uh, and you can keep the good ones, but there's people all of a sudden that, you know, you don't want to hang out with anymore. There's people all of a sudden, uh, you know, you want to hang out with people that encourage you. There's people all of a sudden, it alters your relationship with the world, but also your perception with the world. Julie was telling me this morning about somebody that believed in abortion and until she showed uh, and explained the abortion steps uh, and, you know, and holding, you know, can, can you imagine holding the abortion, aborted baby uh, and all the little pieces, the little arm, the little hand, the little, you know, in your hand? And he said, what? And from then on, guess what? He didn't believe in abortion because he never had been walked through it. It alters, or abortion is sin. It alters your uh, relationship with the Lord. We don't accept what the, Lord, what the world is trying to put on us. We value life. Okay. Uh, I do believe it's possible to become... Now, now this is my closing one. Uh, there, there's more, and I, you know, but you get the idea, right? I do believe it's possible to become not I but the spirit that blows through me. That's, if that's not Christianity, see people, that's why, I, I, you know, people that don't study psychology, you know, you hear a preacher say, ah, psychology, blah, 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 you know, that's because they're ignorant of psychology. Nothing of the mind, God made it all. Now, it can be wrongly applied, that is wrong. But the steps of true psychology is just understanding the mind, and it's all biblical. And we do that tra transformation spiritually, then we transform our mind and we then select new people to be around or at least we're presenting the gospel to others. Otherwise, I'm no longer comfortable with the world. It's Christ in me. So it's not I. Uh, I have a message coming up uh, you know, about the seven uh, cardinal sins. The basis of all sin, all sin is I instead of him i want this i want that i'm that way i i too much i the basis of all sin is i instead of him instead of jesus christ so anyway uh you probably get excited about that book you know you know i did a lot of wading through that to get those nuggets out but see that's how i look at material it's like, okay, what biblical truths are here? I don't care that, sh that she's total heathen, okay? Totally, total heathen. She can't get away from the truths of God. And so when I read material, I'm always looking at what truths of God are in here, okay? Uh, uh, we're going through the grocery store line yesterday, and we get home, and Kathy says, you didn't buy this book, did you? What was it? Magnolia? Magnolia. Oh, yeah, it's a couple down in Texas. Oh, yeah, I got pictures of Kathy going through. Yeah, yeah. See that little, anyway. Uh, but I, but something caught my mind, my eye, and I even forget the title now. But I ripped out four pages, and, and it's like, oh, I want to see that. That they're, you know, they got truths in each page that I, well, is it about Jesus Christ? Did a Christian write that? You know how we got, we, 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 no, no. Now, I do believe they're Christians, but that's beside the point. The, auth the individual authors, there's a bunch of authors in there. They're not Christians that I know of, but the truths, they say them different. And so what happens here, she's saying it differently, but you see how you apply it? And you say, well, that's scriptural. Well, that's scriptural. But so many times we get thrown because people aren't talking. Listen, our Christianese, okay? Melchizedek, so Dave and I are really communicating right now. Uh, because they'll be here next weekend. He'll be here for the tent, the picnic, okay? Melchizedek's are coming up and cooking. Tell everybody else that's not here. Uh, do you think, <laughs> I was telling somebody this morning, do you think we always talk Christianese to the bikers? No. Well, what about if they say something dirty? That's who they are. Uh, I remember years ago when I first got into the Melchizedek's, I'm coming in here, and a woman's coming out here, and she's got a little kid. And I said I was riding with the Hell's Angels, and they're doing 110 miles an hour, and and you know I go on, and so we're walking in after after, and she grabs her little son and looks at me like, 
uh, whoa, you know, she walks on by. So come to find out, she says, you shouldn't be telling that you ride 110 miles an hour. I said, oh, let me see. Then I should have said, uh, Hell's Angels, uh, remember, 65 is the speed limit. Jesus doesn't like you doing more than 65. Uh, how, how long do you think I would have lasted? Sometimes just keep your opinion to yourself. <laughs> Besides, whoever drives 60. Okay, blessings on you.